the MCC, and British High Commission, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar that aims to highlight the UK's green investment landscape, opportunities for investors, and most importantly, ignite discussions surrounding green and sustainable investments. This is a matter that must be given serious consideration right now, as failure to do so will have grave implications on our environments, environmental, social, and governance fabric going forward. The UK government is one of the global pioneers in championing climate change action and sustainable development in what has now become a worldwide movement. By extension, the British High Commission of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, has been doing a tremendous job over the years in insisting this awareness and pushing the agenda through the green is great and great for a sustainable future campaigns. The BMCC is pleased to collaborate with the British High Commission to promote climate change action and sustainable finance, which are top agenda remits of many boards and business leaders today. I'm pleased to share that today's webinar is a fourth and final installment of a four part webinar series under the Great for a Sustainable Future campaign jointly organized by the British High Commission and the BMCC held in March. On this note, it is great to have His Excellency Charles Hay, British High Commissioner to Malaysia with us at this webinar. Only last week, His Excellency spoke at the BHC BMCC Race to Zero webinar which attracted more than 300 participants. Your Excellency, our utmost appreciation to you and the teams at the High Commission for this partnership, which we value highly. The values and urgency of your offices in advancing the green agenda is shared by all of us at the MCC. Ladies and gentlemen, so much has been said about the COVID-19 pandemic and the unforeseen disruption to economies and financial systems. However, if there is to be a main takeaway from this crisis, it is that it has turned our attention to the importance of business resilience and how environment, social and governance, ESG, can be an option towards recovery and sustainability. Even before the pandemic, climate change was already a priority agenda for many leading companies and governments. Investors globally are increasingly becoming aware of ESG investing for sustainable value creation, preferring to invest in companies with high sustainability ratings. Please let me share with you some findings from the Standard Chartered Sustainable Investing Review 2020. Key findings from more than 1,000 investors with specific focus on affluent and high net investors from Hong Kong, Singapore, UAE, and the UK clearly showed amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, interest in sustainable investing continued to grow. 42% of investors plan to allocate up to 15% of their funds in sustainable investments over the next three years. 90% are interested in sustainable investing. As preluded earlier, the UK remains at the forefront with early commitments to reach net zero targets, strong commitments to deliver a greener financial system, as well as the recent 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution announced in November, 2020, creating vast opportunities for investors globally that are increasingly becoming aware of ESG investing for sustainable value creation and a better tomorrow. Hence, we are delighted to have with us Alderman William Russell, the Lord Mayor of the City of London as our special guest speaker. I'm sure we can look forward to thought-provoking views on the critical need to ensure climate considerations are factored into every financial and investment decision, as well as valuable insights on the UK government and the city of London's leadership in green finance 
and investments. The webinar would be incomplete, however, without the in-depth analysis and insights on the UK green investment landscape and opportunities for investors from two subject matter experts, Alan Walker, green finance specialist from the Department of International Trade UK and Ms. Federica Giacometti, Giacometti from the London Stock Exchange Group. On behalf of BMCC, thank you to all of your, all of our speakers and I look forward to your engaging sessions. The BMCC is committed to playing an active role in encouraging our members of both Malaysian and British heritage to also make their own commitment towards lowering carbon emissions. The chamber looks forward to continuing to collaborate with the British High Commission and other related organizations on initiatives to engage Malaysian businesses on climate change action leading up to the UN, UN Climate Change Conference or COP26 in November, 2021. With that, thank you and wishing everyone an insightful afternoon. So Jennifer, I hand over back to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Abra, for taking time off your busy schedule to address our audience this afternoon. So uh, without, without further ado, we'll be moving on to our next session. But however, before we move on a bit of housekeeping rules, um, please before coming with your questions today. However, we will be using the Slido app today. So you should be able to see the QR code on your screen. You can use your devices to scan and then you will have access to slido.com. So please do not uh, submit your questions uh, in the public chat function at the bottom of your screens or the Q&A function, please use Slido. We will attempt to address your questions as much as possible if time permits. We're also running a couple of poll questions today, this afternoon. So uh, as you will see now, um, the first two questions, the first one is, uh, and then the second one. But however, in the interest of time, we are making these four questions available on Slido. They will be live, so you will still have the opportunity to vote. Okay, so now moving on to the highlight of our webinar, we are proud to have um, Alderman William Lassell, the Lord Mayor of City of London. So I would like to now pass the session to His Excellency Charles Hay, who will be the British, Ambassador, British High Commissioner to Kuala Lumpur, to chair and moderate the in conversation with the Lord Mayor session. Over to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you, Abra, for your introductory words. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be the warm up act uh, for the Lord Mayor. Um, the UK, as Jennifer said, has got a very important role this year as the chair and president of the COP26 climate change uh, meeting in, in November in Glasgow. And I think. Increasingly, people are recognizing that this is potentially a real turning point where either we do turn the corner, as it were, and get back on the right track uh, to 1.5 or below, or where we might lose the plot entirely by not doing that. Um, I've been involved in climate change policy in one way or another for the last 17 years. And I think one thing that has definitely changed over the past few years is the perception and realization that climate change is not simply a risk or a cost that people must uh, absorb or deal with. I think now, and I was at a lunch today with a couple of big investors, and we were talking about the way that increasingly people are seeing green and sustainable future as a business opportunity. Uh, and indeed, I think the risks are on the downside for any companies or indeed countries that end up behind this cutting edge. And in the UK, for example, we're talking about creating up to a quarter of a million high quality green jobs in the uh, climate sector over the coming years. And any countries that don't do the same and invest and look to the future will definitely be left behind. And one of the really big drivers in this is of course the private sector. Governments set frameworks, they uh, set the uh, target, well not targets, but they, if you like, they set out the ambition within which the private sector operates. And for me, one of the really interesting things we've seen over the past few years is how uh, finance has re is really changing the rules of the game when it comes to climate change. You know, what we're seeing now is increasingly uh, 
finance houses, investors are unwilling to invest in anything that looks like it's going against the grain. So, for example, we're increasingly seeing uh, stranded assets of coal uh, and other fossil fuels, which are probably never going to be brought out of the ground. And the way that uh, investors can drive uh, behaviour through what they do. And who better to give us an insight into this world than the Lord Mayor of the City of London? Uh, I think the, Lord, the institution of Lord Mayor is, is unique and it's fantastic because uh, the Lord Mayor has the overview of the City of London, which is not just about finance, as people know, but it's that whole ecosystem that brings together finance, risk, insurance, consultancy, uh, all of the different service industries that come together to create that uh, unreplicable uh, ecosystem. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the Lord Mayor's perceptions and views on exactly what is happening right now in the area of green finance. So on that note, let me hand over to the Lord Mayor of the City of London, Alderman William Russell. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you uh, very much for having me. And uh, a very, very kind of you, uh, Charles, with such uh, positive uh, words. Um, and good afternoon all from, from, uh, to afternoon from London. So as Charles says, I'm uh, Alderman William Russell, the 692nd Lord Mayor of the City of London. As Lord Mayor, I'm the, the civic leader of the City of London Corporation and the local governing body for London's financial district, what I call the Square Mile. Uh, and um, we are the oldest elected local government body in the world, dating back to Anglo-Saxon times and before the Norman Conquest. In fact, the Lord Mayor dates back to 1189. As I said, I'm uh, the 692nd. We usually only serve one year in office, but due to the effects of, pande of the pandemic, I was re-elected for a second year in order to provide some continuity and, and stability. Um, and the last time that happened was back in 1860, 1861. Uh, somebody called William Cubitt, who built, of those of you who know London well, Covent Garden, uh, and was uh, part of a very well-known building family. In fact, his younger brother built Belgravia. But I can assure you, I have no intention of doing a, a third year. As well as being ambassador for the city itself, I'm also an ambassador for the UK's financial and professional services sector, which has its home here in the square mile, but which is now a truly nationwide, and indeed worldwide industry. And a major part of my duties is visiting priority markets, including Malaysia, to strengthen links and promote opportunities for cooperation and collaboration. And for obvious reasons, the past year, this engagement has been mainly virtual rather than in person. So I'm glad to be talking to guests from across Malaysia today. And thank you very much, Jennifer Lopez and the, and the team at the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to speak on the UK green investment landscape. We really value the positive impact of Malaysian investment uh, in London. Now, uh, and uh, indeed, what better symbol uh, and the, of the move away from carbon than the fact that one of the most iconic buildings on the River Thames Battersea Power Station is now being redeveloped by Malaysian investors. With COP26 taking place in Glasgow this year and the UK holding the presidency of both COP and the G7, the, grow, the role of green finance in responding to climate change has become my top priority as Lord Mayor. In fact, I've now called myself the Green Lord Mayor, and it's the Green Brick Road to Glasgow. Um, so it is probably the biggest theme on my agenda until my term ends in, in November the 12th. And if you're looking at its serendipity, that is when uh, uh, the, my term ends, but also when the COP meeting ends. But I remind people about COP26 that November is just the start of the UK's presidency. So there is a whole year after that of where we need to win over many people around the world around climate change and how crucial uh, the world and finance, uh, the finance has, uh, what role finance has to play uh, in addressing it. Um, this ultimately is a bigger threat to the world than the pandemic. We cannot have a sustainable planet without sustainable finance. And we need climate to be part of every financial and investment decision. This is the future of finance, where all finance is green, so that what we now call green finance will simply be called finance. It is heartening to see so many commitments to green investment from around the world and a shared determination 
to build back better in a more sustainable way after the impact of the pandemic. And environmental, social and governance investments have soared above their counterparts during the COVID crisis. According to research by BlackRock, 94% of leading sustainable indices beat their parent benchmarks last year, underlying that, underlining that while the challenge is great, the opportunities are also huge for those investors willing to play their part. And the City of London, as a global hub for finance, is shouldering its responsibilities to support the transition to net zero and to bring together the many different efforts to green finance and to finance, finance green. We are supporting the COP26 private finance agenda to provide the right framework for climate reporting, risk management and returns. The city is home to the unique Green Finance Institute, a convening point for climate scientists, policymakers and financial leaders to forge global standards in sustainable finance. We also offer innovative world first green products, a full spectrum of green financial and professional services and gateways to markets uh, around the world. The London Stock Exchange was the first to issue certified green bonds from China, India and the Middle East and home to the first sovereign green bonds from Southeast Asia. I hope that the UK's application to become a dialogue partner of ASEAN and to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership will open even more doors between the UK and Malaysia. I hope today's conference will help us find further opportunities for collaboration as well. And I hope you'll be able to explore all the opportunities for investment and partnership with the UK. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Mayor. I think we're hoping that there'll be a few questions coming into the chat. Um, but uh, before they do come in, I've got a couple of questions if I may to put to you. I was very struck by your comment that in the future all finance will be green and the word green will essentially disappear from the lexicon. Uh, you know, I think that is that has to be undoubtedly true. Um, but as you, you mentioned that BlackRock insurance, but more generally, what's your perception of how green investments have been performing uh, over recent years? Well, I mean, the perception is that they've been hugely positive. I mean, when we had uh, COVID, uh, uh, this time last year, the pandemic started, they'd already started to outperform. And then they, when the markets went down, they outperformed again. Um, and that has continued. But also there has been a huge uh, flow into uh, into ESG funds. So from, Ju from April to June of this year, $71 billion went into ESG funds. Um, and, you know, that is partly because of outperformance, but also partly because people want to be doing the right thing. Uh, and there's this, you know, there, there is this, um, um, you know, various views around the transition, but I'm a big believer that we have to help transition. Nothing's going to happen overnight. Hence what Royal Dutch Shell or some of the oil companies like BP are doing as well. And actually just recently, you'll, you'll see the Exxon Mobil, who were definitely lagging, um, have have put uh, a couple of uh, new board members uh, who have ESG credentials. So uh, look, it, 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 one of the things I feel is that the investment and particularly the asset management, the asset management side has become sort of like the conduit between the corporates and the investors. And they are really critical in influencing where we're headed uh, on all of this. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, the message is loud and clear uh, and it's collaboration. Uh, and everyone is collaborating around that. So, look, I, I, I see um, it is an opportunity, as Mark Carney says, this is the, uh, the, the, the most exciting oppor gener op investment opportunity for a generation around ESG and green finance. Yeah, that's very interesting. And the, um, you talk about a, 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 an uptick um, during the time of the COVID pandemic. Do you think, is there a link there or do you think it's just coincidental that that? No, uh, no I mean, I generally, um, I, mean, I mean, Alan will confirm lots of these things I'm saying because Alan and I have been a few webinars together or calls together, but um, I generally, so it's very interesting, Gillian Tett, who, uh, as you know, is the North American editor for the FT and is and manages rights for the FT on the climate side. Uh, when I was at the World Economic Forum um, uh, a couple of months ago, um, she said, you know, all the journalists said that uh, climate change was going to go backwards after COVID-19, rather like, to be frank, it did 
after the crisis, the financial crisis of 08, 09. Uh, and she said, we're all wrong. And she holds her hands up and said, we got it wrong. Actually, it's come to the forefront even more because what COVID-19 and the pandemic has done, it's focused our attention on what is next and how can we be out there in front of it to make sure it doesn't uh, go the way it will go unless we do something about it. Uh, and, and and so in, it, it surprisingly, and, um, and for me positively, that has, has, is great news. And um, I can see this collaboration around the world, all my virtual trips, whether it's to China, India, uh, other parts of Asia, uh, you know, other, everyone is saying, um, look, we need to come together here. This is an opportunity for the world to work together. Uh, forget the politics, climate change is for all of us to, to, to work together with. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and what I mean, what we're seeing, of course, as, as you know very well, is the falling cost of, for example, renewables with respect to mm. fossil fuels. And when we see that, you know, installed solar is now the cheapest form of, of energy in most markets. I mean, who would have ever expected that uh, 10 or 15 years ago? And for me, one of the biggest signs, if you like, was when you see countries like Japan and South Korea announcing net zero targets. Yeah. and China a net zero target as well, albeit in 2060. So it does feel like we're at some sort of a tipping point. And I'm sure that people will see more and more um, opportunities in being in that market rather than you know, hoping that it will somehow go away uh, as it might have done after the Asian financial crisis. And in terms of the UK offer, what's the, what do you think is our, um, our USP as it were in terms of what we can offer on green investment, which others perhaps can't? Well, I mean, you mentioned the ecosystem, uh, uh, Charles, and the ecosystem is unique, and uh, and that off uh, that is something which um, on my travels people recognise from around the world, uh, and yeah, you know, I'm hugely positive about the future. I mean, Brexit has happened, uh, we've got COVID, um, but. Um, but as you say, that the offer is extraordinary because I remind people 27% of the GDP of the square mile is actually insurance. And, and insurance really hasn't been affected by uh, Brexit. Um, I was on a tr trip, uh, North American virtual trip uh, a, a few weeks ago. And of all the 14 meetings, not one of them said, you know, we're moving out of London. Yes, we've lost some people. We've had to set up offices in Europe. Um, and, you know, don't believe all the headlines, trading moved to Amsterdam, of course, EU chairs of trading in Amsterdam because we're no longer part of the EU. So, I mean, all I would just point out is that that ecosystem's there. Uh, we, you know, had this incredible uh, fintech success story, and I'm generally believe that green finance is the next area which we're already starting to see. Uh, whether it's green bonds, whether it's, uh, you know, also the green Sukuk bonds, is green Islamic bonds, uh, the London Stock Exchange is doing a lot of that. But also what's happening is that, you know, there are now listings uh, from, from equity uh, companies. Uh, I mean, if, if anything, there's a shortage uh, of, of companies listing, and there's a bit of a green bubble potentially developing, which we have to watch because we need, you know, we've got the capital out there, now we need the projects. And, you know, what I would say to uh, my Malaysian friends is that, you know, there is capital to invest in green projects in Malaysia, and there's capital uh, also uh, in Malaysia and in other regions of the world to invest in green projects in the UK. But now we need to find those green projects because there's no lack of capital, in my opinion, uh, um, looking for green uh, sustainable projects. So that is something that, you know, we... We are looking to do, and 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 Alan knows. You know, we set up the office, the OFI, Lord Grimstone, and that. And Alan will probably mention that, but that's now become a, a wonderful sort of a conduit slash gatekeeper for big investments in the UK, and we're seeing a huge amount of interest. Uh, and the and 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 that ecosystem in the city is there to help uh, with various uh, in, in investments. Um, you know, insurance, everyone thinks is insuring your car and your house. I mean, it's insuring cyber, it's insuring climate change. There's so much data. Uh, and I know that everyone's heard the cliched phrase of data is the new oil, but more and more I see what's going on out there. It is. And it's just critical to the success of what we're going to be able to do around climate change. So we have all that expertise. And the one thing that we also have is that, or expertise, is that talent as well. Uh, and that talent doesn't seem to be drifting away anywhere. It's staying in London, which is very positive. Yeah, that's that's very encouraging indeed. And 
And of course, insurance um, has a massive vested, vested interest in all of this because as we see more and more strange uh, weather events, it's going to cost insurance companies more and more uh, and not just cut into their profitability, but, but also introduce elements of unpredictability uh, mm -hmm. that will be extremely unwelcome and of course, increase business costs. Um, I was interested you mentioned the Green Shukuk uh, bonds because that, that's another area where uh, sitting here it looks like London is leading the way and it was interesting to see that I think it was um, yes. yesterday or the, yes. the day before. Two days ago the, there was an issue at 500 million. The sovereign, yeah. yeah, the second sovereign Shukuk bond yeah. which was a great success as far as I could see. So, you know, another area and, and the confluence of those two is really interesting, isn't it, when you, when you bring together uh, Shukuk and Green Finance as well. Now, I don't know if we have any uh, questions coming in um, for the moment. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Um, I can't see any on my system, but I'm not part of the Slido system. Well, I mean, the um, other thing I would add on, on the bonds, um, so we held the Green Horizon Summit at, at the Mansion House, which I co-chaired with Mark Carney back in November. And at that, uh, at that time, uh, there were some big announcements from the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, and one of them was the Green Sovereign Bond. Um, and that is, is, you know, there's some announcements coming out in June. So I guess between June and November, it will be issued. He's committed to 15 billion. I'm convinced it will be more than 15 billion if we want it to be, uh, because I think demand's going to be huge. I think, I'm hearing, and Alan will know all about this, that there's going to be a retail portion. So every retail investor in the UK can buy into this green bond. And one of the things that's so exciting is that in all the surveys, the polls, 85% of the population of the UK get climate change. So they're all on board. So this is where this the government with Boris, the Prime Minister's 10 points, is moving forward very successfully with the people of the country of what we've got to do around climate change. But as you pointed out, Charles, it's going to create a huge number of jobs at the same time. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, we mentioned was TCFD, which is mandatory by 2025. I think it will be it will happen before that, even though, and I would urge everyone in Malaysia to or corporates to look at TCFD. If everyone can sign up to it, that is the way forward. And it's the one standard that really seems to be getting even more traction than, the, than others. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it, uh, and the final thing is this COP26 has been described as the zero emissions COP. And we want every country and every country to sign up to a, a, a zero emissions uh, a commitment. Uh, and, um, and to be frank, uh, we want corporates to sign up. And as you know, the City of London, we've signed up to zero emissions by 2040 within the square mile. And, you know, there's this momentum. And to be frank, if people don't sign up, everyone's going to know about it. And I think that will, you came, you added the point, that will affect investment, not only potentially in countries, but also in corporates, if they haven't be, aren't seen to be doing the right thing. Uh, and, and that's where the momentum is taking us. And that is why I genuinely believe there's, you know, signs of optimism, as Sir David Attenborough say, you know, we can move very quickly. And in a way, COVID-19 with the vaccines has just showed when there's something like this, we can move quickly and the world seems to be moving quickly. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got a couple of questions coming in. I think we've, we've got a couple of minutes left in, in this section of the webinar, so we can look at the, the first question is our views on the efficacy of the Paris Accord. I don't know what your view is, Lord Mayor, but mine is that um, firstly, countries are not meeting their obligations that they signed up to under the Paris Accord. And even if they did, it wouldn't be enough uh, to keep us from uh, catas well, not catastrophic, but very dangerous uh, levels of, uh, of global warming, which is why we need to do more and be more ambitious uh, this year. And then the second question is, which, which uh, sector, Lord Mayor, do you think in the, green, in the UK's green sector will receive the most attention from the UK government? Will it be solar, wind or hydro or whatever? Well, I, I will actually say all of them will receive attention of the government. Um, the one sector that I think is very interesting is around uh, the electric cars, which there's a, being a, commit, a commitment of 2030. So that's only nine years away uh, for electric cars. So to be frank, 
we don't have enough electric chargers so and battery giga battery uh, plants um so i think that will be something where private and public will come together uh, and that is an area that we've got to move pretty quickly on um uh, and then of course the other area is i think there are 26 million houses that need to be retrofitted by 2050 so we've got a bit more time but that will be uh, a sector that will, um, you know, the building efficiencies, et cetera. Um, but, you know, to be frank, I think government's uh, focusing on uh, across the board, um, but, uh, but it is, is this great opportunity for private and public finance to come together to, to make it all happen. Yeah, that's very interesting. And of course, from, the, from a UK perspective, we're a, a windy island uh, off yeah, the coast of the continent. So, uh, for us in the UK, wind power is the thing, and I think. Well, I think as you know, we will we lose our last coal far power station by 2022. I look at Alan, who will not. Yes, um, so um, that uh, is will be a very exciting moment as well for us. Absolutely, and the UK with more installed wind capacity than any other country uh, on Earth, uh, which is a tremendous achievement in just 20 20 odd years. Lord Mayor, thank you so much. That's been absolutely fantastic. I think we now need to keep to time uh, and move on to the next part of the webinar. So I think it's time for me to thank you again, Lord Mayor, for well, fascinating. Thank you for having me and well done on all, all you're doing uh, there in Malaysia. And uh, thank you to my Malaysian friends. Uh, and, um, you know, looking forward to doing what we can to work with you uh, to get to that zero emissions by 2050. And Alan, good thank to see you, you as well. Likewise, yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Much. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, uh, Charles, the Lord Mayor. We will definitely remember the Green Lord Mayor, and we look forward to having you again, hopefully this year again, before COP26. And Charles, thank you for joining us, and thank you, as always, we are always very appreciative of your support and um, being here today with us for an excellent session. So now we will be moving on to our second part of the webinar. Before we move on to the second part of the webinar, let's see the results of the first two poll sessions. Very good. I'm sure my colleagues will be very happy to see that, the interest. And um, please, um, okay, uh, let's move on to, I think we are also going to see the next two poll questions before we move to Ellen. Okay, the poll, as I mentioned, the poll questions are live on Slido. Please uh, vote. We want to hear your views. So with that, uh, let's move on to our next session, which will be the speaking session. And the first speaker for today is Ellen Walker the Green Finance Specialist, Finance and Professional Services Group of the UK Department for International Trade. Ellen, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Lord Mayor. All, always a fascinating uh, speech, yeah. as he really gets it. <laughs> um, so I'm Alan Walker. I'm the um, Green Finance Specialist for the UK Department for International Trade. I'm also on the Cross Whitehall um, uh, committees with other government departments who are very, very involved in this um, in this whole movement. That's the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Treasury, of course, the Inter Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the Green, the Green Finance Institute, uh, all, all mentioned before. So I've been with government for um, six years. I thought it was going to be six months, but it's ended up being uh, six years. Um, but before that, I used to run for Mazda in Abu Dhabi, the, the world's biggest eco city, I used to run their clean, clean finance um, business from there, more into private equity and venture capital, which I'll come back to, into in just a second. But one place I worked for before was um, in Brazil. I, I lived in Brazil for many years, which is a big, big um, renewable energy country with hydro and wind and solar and everything else, and had the great privilege uh, running pre, uh, Credit Suisse's team there as well. And so um, one thing... One person I met down there was Jess Staley, who happened to be with JP Morgan at the time, um, who now runs Barclays. He's, he's the CEO of Barclays. I haven't seen him for a long time, but I, but I know from Brazil. And he said, this is a great quote, actually. Um, climate today, climate finance today is like technology was in 1995. If you think about it, all of the Amazons, Googles didn't really exist in 1995. And now it dominates 40% of the economy. 
I think it's a fair argument that dealing with climate and the environment is in the same position now. And we've heard this from all our speakers before. Climate change is the investment opportunity of our generation. And it has to be. It has to be for our children. So it, 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 that's a really good quote from Jess Staley, the CEO of Barclays. Now, the UK um, in the last 30 years, I think that's right, um, has reduced its, um, it has, has grown its economy by about 70%. That's just, you know, 3% a year, growing, growing, growing. Uh, so it's about, over, over the last 30 years, it's grown its economy by about 70%, but it's decreased its emissions by about 50%. And as the Lord Mayor pointed out, this, this is because of phasing out coal-fired power stations. And so now the UK only accounts for about 1.2% of global emissions, which isn't honestly in the big picture of nothing. Yeah, it, it's not very big. Yeah, we import stuff from China. Talking about China, China opens up a new coal-fired power station every month on average. So China accounts for 26% of the world's emissions. We account for 1% of the world's emissions. So we are leading the way in all this stuff. And uh, you can only talk about it so much. If you're in the financial sector, you've got to realize how many um, uh, different types of financial instruments are available in London for you guys to, to invest in. Um, and you know that's I'm not going to go through the whole list now because we're running a bit short on time, but it, it's lending money to green companies, uh, even the ones which are brown but going green called transitional companies companies like oil companies, for example, like Shell and BP and so on. Then there's project lending, uh, project finance, which is my background, and that's you know building projects uh, anywhere around the world. And, uh, and believe me, Standard Chart and HSBC are very, very good at this. Uh, so we've got a very good uh, story to tell in the UK. Then we have the capital markets. This is the green bonds and green equities. Federica is coming on next on the Stock Exchange. She's, you know, she, she knows much more about this than I do. But, you know, in the last few days, we've had, last few weeks, actually, we've had um, uh, the Saudis looking to launch a green bond. We've had the Qataris uh, to build new cities in the desert. We've had Uruguay. We've had all these countries from all around the world, and hopefully um, continuing with Malaysia, who's already done lots of these things already. Uh, and that can also be in an Islamically um, sensitive way. So cook bonds and all the rest of it, as has been mentioned before are big stuff on the London stock market. That's uh, Federica's uh, point. Then there's retail finance. It's lending money to me and you to go and buy an electric vehicle. It's lending money to me and you to go and get a green mortgage to increase the energy efficiency of your house. It's carbon credits. That's a bit of a dodgy subject. I'm not gonna go on to now, uh, but don't forget the world's leading carbon credit companies back in the 1990s, when this whole market started up under the Kyoto Protocol were British companies. Uh, that's going to come back. We've left the European Union now, whether you like it or not, and we will be setting up some kind of uh, some kind of carbon market ourselves here in the UK. It means basically you're allowed to per you're allowed to pollute so much, but a decreasing amount every year. So if you're ahead of the curve on a polluting less, you can sell your carbon credit to someone to someone who is not. It's good market economies. Uh, economics and believe me it started in the united states of america with the acid rain and sulfur dioxide markets in the uh, in the 1990s so it's a well tried and trusted thing then of course there's venture capital and private equity of which we have tons of companies in the uk really really focusing on this sector new types of graphene new types of fuel cells all, all these different things and in fact the prime minister in his um boris johnson in his uh, post-COVID recovery, uh, we're, we're going to get out of this recovery by creating green jobs. And it's not just in London, it's elsewhere throughout the country. And again, I don't have much time, but this is offshore wind where already we're a world leader by far. Uh, it's hydrogen, it's small nuclear power plants, it's electric vehicles, it's public transport, it's, it's, it's more energy efficient jet zero, um, zero emission uh, power from hydrogen, for example, for airplanes and for ships. It's energy efficient homes, as I mentioned. It's, um, it's carbon capture and storage. It's nature based solutions like flood control and things like that. And of course, green finance, which is what we do here in the city. And uh, don't forget, um, of all the money that goes into these green funds around the world, uh, this is not British money we have here in the UK, it's global money. And it's the biggest pot of global money in the world. 
And as someone mentioned, I can't remember who, sorry, but about 50% of it now goes in ESG, economic, so environmental, social, and government investment. So it's a massive industry. And then we have the specialist funds in our country. And this is where you can put up, Jennifer, if you mind, uh, one of those slides I had up, because I haven't got much time. Uh, we have some of the, um, some of the, we're about 20, 25 of the world's leading um, specialist green and sustainable funds in this country. So you can see at the bottom of that, don't, don't read every word on this because we haven't got time, but um, uh, this is encouraged enormously in the UK. So at the bottom there, you can see Equitix, uh, which has invested in, for example, the new Crossrail um, uh, energy efficient um, underground rail system in London. But outside of London, you've got Foresight, Greenco, Impacts, Octopus, um, investing not just in the UK, um, but where they own vast amounts of solar and wind assets across the UK, costs of which are dropping like stone, uh, but also in other countries now. It's like Poland, which is a big coal polluting country, in Spain, Portugal, et cetera, et cetera, and, and increasingly all around the world. The Green Investment Bank, which was, uh, sorry, the uh, Green Investment Group now, it was part of the UK government, but got privatised. They are investing all over the world, and I'm sure they're active in Malaysia. I tried to call them this week, but I couldn't get through to the person I needed to speak to. Uh, but I'm sure they're very, very active in, in, in Malaysia. So, so look, I mean, all, all of these things are happening um, in a big way. This week alone, another one of these 25 companies, Sustainable Development Capital Limited, uh, we know all these people. We, we, we meet them all the time to work out who can invest in them. All right, so in, in some of these, if you can go to the next... Um, Next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the second bullet point on this slide, over 20 leading specialist green funds and yield codes. And there are some of the names mentioned there. They are invested in by Korean pension funds, by the Saudi uh, uh, governments, by um, Brazilian you know, Petrobras pension fund. I mean, for example, so you can invest in all of these funds and have your assets managed by them and they're world leaders in it. There's about 20 of them, something like that. So um, next slide, please, if you wouldn't mind. You can either invest in funds or you can invest in projects. And here are just some of the more recent um, investments. And, and, and obviously, as, as been mentioned before, offshore wind is a multi, multi-billion pound industry in this country. We're a very windy country. And unbelievably to me, um, the North Sea, where many of these projects are, is actually quite shallow. It's not very deep at all. So you can put the wind turbines in, um, about 70 meters of water. It's not two miles deep, like the Mindanao Trench off, uh, off of the uh, Philippines, for example. Uh, and so, you know, we've become world leaders in this. So you can invest directly in these projects as well. You don't have to invest in the fund, but many of these funds will invest in the projects I'm talking about here. And I'm not gonna go through all these now, but it's it's all over, it's all over the place. Mazda and Abu Dhabi, who I used to work for, has invested in the London Array project off the coast of London. So when you fly into London from anywhere, you'll go down the River Thames estuary, which is where I'm sitting now, and um, and you, you can fly over the London Array, which you know, Mazda and Abu Dhabi has put billions of pounds into and can, will continue to do that as well. So all of these things, all good news. Um, we have, um, from the government point of view, as has been mentioned before, we have the 10-point plan from the government. We're trying to get the green economy to get us out of an economic potential mess, like, like most countries. The UK's uh, public sector debt has increased enormously because of COVID. But if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do something good about this, and this is where the, the city is so good, the, 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 the city of London, I mean, it is just you do something positively. So it, it's financing all of these things. So if you look at the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Jennifer, thank you. All right, so that, these are some more examples of, of, of these um, various investments. As I said, they're in funds or directly in projects, or it could be in venture capital. It could be in all of these things. You know, if you're investing in uh, an offshore wind farm, you're going to be investing billions and billions, of, well, millions of pounds in a billion pound project. If you're investing in a small um, venture capital company like Zook, for example, which has set up the, uh, as you can see there on the first bullet point, set up the first electric vehicle, uh, charging fund in this company that you're talking there about you know the, the price of an apartment you know it's, it, you, you can invest in smaller bits you don't have to invest in the big bits it depends on where you're coming from and whether you're a retail investor a personal investor a high net worth investor 
etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of all of these uh, um, all of these things exist exist in the uk next slide please jennifer if you wouldn't mind then we have the government um uh, and you, it's not a very good picture here but you can see so, so the government doesn't have much money um we're relying on green finance which is basically private sector money and as the law bear said earlier there is money all around the world looking for a home interest rates are incredibly historically low equity markets you could say are overvalued who knows who knows, whatever but you know it's if you can invest your money in something long term like infrastructure that i think is the best way to invest your money going forward uh as, as part of a, a, a diversified portfolio. So, for example, um, UK Export Finance, which is part of my department, Department for International Trade, um, that is supporting UK exporters all over the world, including, you can see that picture, it's a pretty bad picture. I, I was there a couple of, a, about a year ago, that's in Mexico City, and that's UK Red London Buses, an iconic symbol powered by very energy efficient fuels, a combination of hydrogen and well, it depends on the bus, but but you know that's the point though is that we're trying to do a lot more on the green side to to increase our exports. And it's not just renewable energy; it's um, sustainable agriculture. It, it's it's um, it's nature-based solutions like flood control, for example. It's all of these things. And again, as being mentioned, one thing you can never forget about this economy is the size of the insurance market, uh, which is you know insuring everything from. Um, earthquakes in Colombia to, to, to flood control in, uh, in Bangladesh. So all of these things happen here, right here in London. And I'm really pleased to be able to tell you that today. I'm going to stop there and, and let anyone ask any questions they would like. Um, please, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry if I've overused my time. Thanks, Alan. No, you're perfect. The uh, timing is good. Uh, we will take the questions. There's a couple of questions coming in, but we'll take the questions after Federica's session. So now moving on perfect. to... Uh, yes, thanks. So now moving on to our second speaker, Federica Giacometti, who is the Business Development Senior Associate for Multi-Asset Primary Markets of the London Stock Exchange Group. Federica, over to you for your presentation. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my presentation as well so we can go through it all together. Hope you can all see. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And a lot of the points that I'll be touching on have already been mentioned by Alan and the Lord Mayor previously. Um, it's all projects that we've all been working on, um, as, they, as they mentioned earlier. London has really become um, an active center for um, in sustainable finance. Uh, from my side, just as a quick presentation, I work in the London Stock Exchange within the fixed income team mainly. Uh, I will be touching on multi-asset uh, during the presentation, uh, but I focus on debt capital markets and have been working uh, on issuance like the Hong Kong uh, sovereign green bond, um, bonds from Qatar and now uh, the, the latest one that has issued a, a sustainable sovereign bond from uh, from Chile, uh, which is actually also Formosa bond. So they have is issued their debut sustainable Formosa bond and priced it just yesterday. So really a, a very active area. Um, to give you a quick background, uh, most of you will probably know London Stock Exchange as our listing venue but we aren't only that we have uh, a very large range of um, of data um, provided by FTSE and uh, um, yield book and also support capital formation and post trading and um, this has increased exponentially since the merger with Refinitiv about a month and a half ago um, and we now have even more ESG proprietary data that will, we will work together with Refinitiv to um, expand our index, ESG index base and in general, our sustainable finance offering. So there's a lot that we will discuss today that is happening, but there will be even more projects coming on 
um, of course, uh, looking forward to COP26, but in general, from all this new available data that we will have. Uh, this merger with Refinitiv has also allowed us to expand globally even more. Uh, we have become a team of 25,000 people uh, with more than 50% of our base in Asia. Um, this will allow us to really have people on the ground understanding the market and the regional needs um, of, of the issuers. This will be especially helpful in sustainable finance to really understand what projects and what sectors those regions are looking to expand into. Uh, a lot of the, um, of the projects we will be discussing today have led us to, uh, to win the Green Exchange of the Year Award last year. Uh, LSE has been a pioneer in the area for many years, uh, driving best price practice in disclosure and enabling a very strong transition to a sustainable and a green economy. And we were recognized for this last year, we'll see the upcoming year, how it will go. So as a, a quick overview of um, sustainable finance at LSE, we are able to offer the most integrated suite of global sustainable investment and capital raising tools um, and are really supporting the economy's long-term growth um, opportunities. We facilitate the transition to net zero carbon emission for issuers and investors. Um, and really have an offering that suits all needs across asset class. Um, climate risk has been more and more on our minds uh, lately, and we are working together with issuers to enable the transition to a sustainable and low carbon economy, um, supporting the innovation that um, companies uh, bring forward in. Uh, uh, especially for equity and funds, but also uh, being next to sovereigns and supranationals um, in their transition to a greener economy. Uh, for this, we now have cross-asset class green focus with uh, more than 100 ESG indexes, 90, more than 90 companies um, that have a green economy mark, uh, almost, 280 green and sustainable bonds uh, throughout 80 countries and 50 currencies, um, raising $80 billion and um, more than 100 ESG and ETFs and 29 green funds with an aggregate value of over $70 billion. To, to start um, our conversation into our data especially, um, I wanted to walk you through a few things that we have been uh, working on in the last few years. These are our comprehensive guides to the green finance and green product landscape. When FTSE launched the FTSE for Good indexes more than 20 years ago, it was an extremely niche area. We we're almost ridiculed in the investment sector by what we were doing in that moment but it's now become pretty much mainstream. And really we believe this year is the year where it turns around and green starts becoming, as Lord Mayor was saying, not just green investing, but investing in general. Um, um, all of these uh, guides that we have prepared, so from ESG reporting to navigating green finance landscape are the backbone to our ESG and climate disclosures um, FTSE Russell creates ESG rating for more than 14,000 companies worldwide. Um, and this has really um, supported the fact that having a rating scale, having points and markers, we have more than 300 data markers, um, allows companies to um, rebalance what they're doing and focus on the areas where they might be slightly more lacking. Um, for example, there's been a 28% rise in the number of issuers who scored more than 75% in, in, in these ESG disclosure. Um, so having um, a guide or something to, to refer back to and that supports uh, their efforts and where they can focus themselves more is really pushing companies to do better and transition more. This data that we, we had 
um, since refinitive join has increased uh, by a very large amount and uh, they have brought in their own universe of more than 10,000 global companies covering 80% of global market cap. Uh, so going forward, we will have even more material data and open source methodology and uh, in, in general, very large amount of transparency with the data that we have um, that will allow us to create more projects and work with even more companies. So the all data that is also available for, for investors and for, for companies. Now moving more towards the equity side, um, there we have started really championing green economy issuers since 2019 when we launched our green economy classification mark, um, which is available to all equity issuer, issuers with a meaningful exposure to the green economy. Uh, in general, this means um, issuers that have more than 50% of their revenues generated from business activities within what we considered uh, our green revenue classification system, which is uh, available to, to, to view separately. Um, as of today, we have 95 equity issuers who have the mark now with a combined market cap of 140 billion, a bit more, um, a bit higher than 170 billion dollars. Um, this is split both through corporate and funds, so 56 corporate and 29 funds, but also through market and size. Uh, so we have 54 on the main market and 41 of these are um, on the on, on AIM. As we can see here, the institutionality of the investors holding um, gem companies is quite strong. And also the focus um, globally is, has been more toward UK and uh, European based um, institutional investors. But we're now, as Alan mentioned, becoming more and more diversified in, um, in our holdings and have institutional investors from all over the world, especially from OECD countries. Uh, green economy uh, issuers are the third largest group for capital raisings. So there is more and more opportunities for sure for trying to get into this kind of, uh, of investment. And we see this just growing uh, immensely and it will definitely not stop uh, going forward. Uh, one area where I'm really much more focused and almost uh, and very happy to, to discuss is sustainable bond market. So London um, has always been a pioneer within uh, sustainability. Um, and we were the first exchange to have um, green bond segment in 2015. This became our sustainable bond market in uh, 2019. Uh, and it started to introduce not only green, but also social and sustainable bonds. These two, especially are two areas where we've seen an incredible growth in the last year. Um, sustainable bonds increased by, increased by uh, nearly 100% and social bonds increased by 1500%. Um, their proceeds raised globally. This has, of course, um, been supported, unfortunately, by the pandemic. Um, and we saw on our market the likes of uh, ASDB uh, issuing a fight for COVID-19 bond, but also um, externally we saw Indonesia with their pandemic bond and the, the European Union issuing its the first social bonds raising 17 billion euros for their share program. So in, we believe this the pandemic gave a very strong push to these two sub segments, but we continue to see them grow very much in the next few years. Um, another uh, trend that we have confirmed in the last uh, in the last year is the pure evidence of greenium on ESG bonds. Um, it has become more and more obvious for investors that investing in green isn't only something that they are mandated to do often, but is actually quite um, profitable as well. Um, and uh, investing in uh, vanilla security rather than a green bond 
doesn't make any difference for them. It just it makes something better for, for the world and uh, um, often gives them back better returns. Uh, this has been especially relevant for industrial and infrastructure companies. And we have seen issuers also uh, start listing their, directly their debut bonds as um, sustainable social or green bonds. An example is Burberry that um, came for the, onto the market for the first time ever last year with, and it did it so with a sustainable bond. Um, just to, to reshow you again a bit, our sustainable bond market, um, there are 274 uh, with the recent issuances, almost 280 bonds in 17 currencies uh, through 70 uh, different bond issuers. Um, it's a really diversified market, um, not only as, uh, as issuers, but as geographies, um, industries, and, and much more. Um, as you can see, as I was mentioning, we went from green being our main focus to social and sustainability starting to really take up uh, a lot of space within the bond market. Uh, this year, um, we had the strongest, well, now end of March, so we can definitely say that we had the strongest ever first quarter in the sustainable bonds. Um, and, um, and, and we just see this, uh, keep, this trend keep going on for the, for the next quarters as well. Um, sustainability is the first thing on the mind of uh, a lot of investors and a lot of issuers who are really looking to, to transition to, to a better economy and doing so also in the vision of COP26 coming up later this year um, and therefore wanting to, to gain even some more momentum uh, from, from visibility of, of that event. The sustainable bond market has changed uh, quite a bit in the last few years. As I was mentioning, we started with just green in 2015. We then expanded to green sustainability and social in 2019. And in the last year, we've, ha we've added sustainability linked bonds. Uh, so all forward bonds related to forward looking performance uh, based on commitment to future sustainability improvement. And just uh, a, a month and a half ago, we launched our transition bond segment as well. Um, this will really help those issuers who are in um, industries which are more brown and less easy to, um, to produce green revenues, but are, that are really working towards transitioning to, toward a more green economy. And we would want to be there, support them, and be able to, to have them, them access international capital markets um, through us for, for these kinds of securities. And we actually have had the first two transition bonds from Cadence Gas will be coming to our market um, this week. Uh, just a quick overview on our admission criteria, just to show you how um, in depth we, we tend to go with, with these things. Something that um, is, is coming more and more uh, to, to light lately is the problem of greenwashing and of just not being as transparent as might be needed for this kind of securities. Um, we require certified use of proceed by an independent second party or third um, party certification. Um, and we require also ongoing disclosure for the, um, for the full life of the bond. Uh, we need to see what projects uh, they're working on, the status of the project, and uh, in general, we need to see this at least every 12 months. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a few case studies because I think it will really show you the breadth of uh, um, green bonds, not only green, but in general, sustainable bonds on our market. Um, starting from Mexico, the United Mexican States were the first um, sovereign from the Americas to list their um, sustainable, uh, to, to in general issue, um, a bond linked to um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it was 
extremely well uh, um, well accepted from investors, received more than six and a half times over subscription, and um, and they are really looking forward to to growing this their portfolio of uh, of green um, green securities. One issuer that has done this, uh, another issuer from the Americas that has done this and continues to do this is Chile. Uh, Chile came to London market in 2019, and they issued the first green sovereign green bonds from the Americas. Um, they came back to our markets again with another green bond in 2020. They came back at the beginning of this year with a social bond. Uh, with actually two social bonds with uh, uh, very tight uh, yields and ended up coming to market yesterday with a Formosa sustainable bond. Um, just to see in the matter of a year and a half, um, how much they've grown, how diversified their green offering now is. Um, and it's really a country that is looking forward to, to transition the entire country to to green and and uh, to a cleaner economy. Uh, another very interesting deal was for Qatar. Um, we have a very deep pool of issuers from the Middle East. Uh, we mentioned a bit earlier about um, the cook bonds on, on, on LSE, and it's definitely an area where we are very strong internationally. Um, we have a very deep pool and very strong investors from the Islamic finance community. Uh, QNB Finance is one of the issuers that have issued with us for, for several years. And this time, this, in 2020, they issued the first uh, green bond out of Qatar. This allowed them to um, really diversify both their distribution uh, of, of investor base uh, by, um, uh, by type of investor, but even more geographically. So they had um, investors from Europe, who, especially from London, are extremely focused on green, but also from the US, uh, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, as I was mentioning early, Burberry launched its W bond this year as a sustainability bond. Um, it was very particular for investors because as a debut bond, they didn't even have a, have a reference um, to go to for yield, but it was just such an, uh, an interesting approach from retail uh, that they, they achieved a, a very good, um, good coupon and uh, a good size of 300 million, 300 million pounds. And this is a one that I think is extremely interesting um, just to see how many um, regions are really now covering green and not only regions, but also currencies. Uh, so Acorn Holdings was the first ever green bond out of Kenya. And they issued a, a 5 billion Kenyan shelling bond um, supported by Garant Co. This bond was so well, uh, so focused, um, had such interesting projects and such a strong appetite from investors that the, it was able to, uh, plus the additional of the guarantee, it was able to, uh, um, to go over the rating of the sovereign and, and achieve an even higher rating. Um, of course, coupon, a higher coupon given the nature of the uh, of such a volatile currency, but really um, a step towards uh, the right direction of having emerging markets really focus um, on growing through green. Um, last point I will touch upon just to cover all our asset classes is sustainable funds. Um, LSE has 29 listed vehicles uh, investing in over 17 billion pounds of renewable assets. Uh, there have been three green fund IPOs every year for the last three years. And um, it started out with normal renewables and the largest funds are still across wind and solar, uh, but they're really um, differentiating in also into energy efficiency, like um, SDCL, 
and um, energy storage, like a gold street. Uh, these are the top 10, a few of which um, Alan had mentioned as well, like four sites. They're really focused uh, on the projects throughout um, the UK and Europe. And, um, and some key more recent transaction is, for example, the BH Global Sustainable Energy Opportunity Fund, who raised 243 billion uh, million pounds um, early in February of this year. A couple of case studies here as well. One is for Green Coat UK Wind, the largest um, green fund on LSE, listed in 2013, but came back to the market several times. Um, given its size and also the size of the following one, both are within the FTSE 250. Uh, and have always either performed performed aligned to or overperformed uh, the FTSE 250. Uh, same can be said for renewables infrastructure. They have outperformed the um, um, FTSE 250 throughout their pro process and have um, their strategy is uh, not only on wind like green court, but more toward wind and solar. Uh, as a particular focus, but also looking at other um, renewable energy bases. In general, the investor base for our uh, green funds is more uh, has been more UK focused, similar to um, to equity. While debt is much more diversified, just as the type of investors that come to the market, um, but it is m growing more and more toward um, diversification internationally and also it it started be, from a very institutional base on of investors but has now been um starting to get into retail investors as well um this is just a bit about a quick overview of our offering but there is a lot going on at the moment it's such a vibrant um vibrant sector right now sustainability and that we really look forward to seeing where it will grow from from here on thank you Federica, for the informative session it's really encouraging to hear i think i did hear that you mentioned that the this year is the strongest first ever quarter for sustainable bond markets. So it's really encouraging to hear that. And it is also, you know, interesting you say it's a great time to for sustainable investments, right? So it's uh it's really uh wonderful to hear that you encouraging for many of our audience, I'm sure, who are looking for this opportunity. And Ellen, welcome back. Um so before we go, uh, just give me a few seconds. Before we go to the Q&A sessions, there has been questions coming already have come in. So let's look at the poll, um, answers to the poll. We'll quickly look at it. So it's interesting to see that the biggest challenge is the expected risks and rewards. <laughs> Okay, and the, okay, back to our speakers. Ellen, you're smiling on the poll. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Any comments? Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, uh, offshore wind uh, in the UK as the world's leader. Um, this was supported by, I'm a firm believer in private capital helped by incentives from the government. And the whole offshore wind industry, the reason it's the world's biggest now is because the UK government <clears throat> it just guaranteed the floor price of the electricity okay. being sold by uh, under something called a contract for difference. It's, it's too complicated to explain now. I'm sure most of your viewers will know exactly what a contract for difference is. But it's a floor price for the electricity. And, and, and that <clears throat> has just made it one of the biggest industries in the world. And the costs have collapsed. The costs of making these enormous wind turbines, <clears throat> which if you, if you can imagine, of the size of a jumbo jet's wing. I mean, it's just enormous, all right? But they are float, they're doing that 
And now we're making hydrogen out of that during the night when no one's using the electricity. So it takes a combination of mm -hmm. government and private sector. And I've always believed that. <clears throat> and, and, and some of the examples that Federica have given there, it's just superb <clears throat> in terms of the returns available on, um, <clears throat> well, you mentioned the first quarter thing, but, but also the returns are higher because you, you, you're doing a good thing and everyone's piling into it, therefore, every SDG fund, ESG fund or S Sustainable Development Goal Fund uh, are investing in these, in these businesses now. So that's why this is the biggest growing part of finance, um, along with fintech, I mean, which is also superb. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's why we're doing well in London. So, look, it, any Malaysian investor, you can invest, I mean, you can just email either of us, but, you know, you can invest in offshore wind, you can invest in hydrogen, you can invest in the London new uh, underground system, energy efficient. Um, oh, that's on the import side. That's, that's on the inward investment side. On the outward investment side, we're doing uh, a new metro in Lima in Peru. Uh, we're doing the Mexican buses I showed you earlier. So it's on both the import and export side. And I can assure you, um, that the entire government here is focused on this very sharply uh, because we're good at this and we want to carry on being good at this. And there's lots of other people in the country, uh, other countries trying to do the same thing. But at the end of the day, I hate that phrase, at the end of the day, though, um, we do have the biggest pools of capital and the most efficiently developed capital markets, as you've just heard from Federica, and the most um, uh, the, the most uh, sophisticated project finance banks I in the world. So um, honestly, I, it depends what you want to be invested in. You can go anything from venture capital to uh, big project finance, but it's a great place to be. And I encourage anybody to call us anytime soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I'm sure, sure. Um, they give a bit of confidence to the potential investors out there listening in, Alan. Yeah, what you have said. Um, there's an interesting question. I know we looked at, <laughs> we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, companies investing. I think we are looking at a larger investor community sometimes for some of these projects. But there's a question from the audience here on what perhaps Ellen or even Federica, you can give your views. This is a question from the audience. What is the current adoption rate of ESG principles by SMEs, SMEs, you know, in the UK? Yeah, what, well, what's your view on that? How do you see? Because SMEs are a great influencer and they play a role in the supply yeah. chain, any supply chain. So what has been their role and what, where do you see their adoption rates? I, I, okay, well, I'm going to pass on to Federica. She'll know much more about this than me. But um, any small and medium enterprise at the moment, um, uh, at the moment in the UK, mm. is trying to get involved in exactly this field because they know mm -hmm. it's the future. And so it's graphene, it's hydrogen, it's um, it, it's it, it's um, well, small nuclear is probably a bad example, but you know it, it's. You're, you're, going to make, you're going to make more money by investing in good than bad uh, going forward. Um, and, and so most uh, SMEs in this country that we're setting up are involved in things like flood control, they're involved in sustainable agriculture, they're involved in graphene, they're involved in fuel cells, all of these things. And I, 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 I can't spend time now telling you, and I can't recommend one over the other, but, but it's just happening enormously. Uh, mm. Federica, over to you. No, I absolutely agree. And um, even the ones that aren't uh, focusing only on um, green specific projects ha are trying to uh, make changes in everything that is more the S and the G. So everything that concerns more of the social and governance side of, um, of, of, their, of their entities. Um, mm -hmm. London started doing analysis of ESG uh, disclosures for starting from the FTSE 100 to the FTSE 250 and going more and more toward SMEs um, and, and are now looking at more than 15, 14,000 companies. Um, so there is a lot of push towards also the uh, smaller entities to 
to start looking at, at what they can do in green social and, uh, and, and governance. And also uh, a lot of companies that are just starting are already starting with looking at, um, at this for the future. So they, it's not something that they will have to adapt to. It's something that they already start thinking out when uh, creating their, their company. Uh, exactly. And, and if I could just carry on really quickly there, Federica, it's a very good point. So um, some of the examples of the funds that you, that you have on, on the stock exchange, um, uh, I've just seen a few brochures recently from, from their, um, you know, from their, and again, we can't promote anything more above than another, but um, a lot of these people are doing uh, things like replacing old fashioned uh, fluorescent tubes in, in supermarkets. Tesco's, Banco Santander here in London, or which is what, what bought Lloyd's Bank. Uh, the, these companies are saving a lot of money by replacing these old lights and replacing them with more efficient lighting, which is coming from small and medium enterprises. Okay, so so all of this energy efficient thing, the NHS, the National Health Service in our country, which is like almost a national religion, um, and, and probably rightly so uses about 18% of all the power in the, in, in the UK, in the public sector. So if you can replace their lighting systems and you can replace their sewage systems and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff, all these pipeline stuff, it makes a massive, massive difference. And if private enterprise can help with that, which it will have to because the government doesn't have much money, that's the way to go forward, in my view. Yes, agree. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the next question, there, there is um, participants who are asking for Alan's and Frederica's contact. Maybe admin can post that contact details on the chat box so that we... Yes, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Alan, I think this is quite a straightforward uh, question. Maybe, I don't know. They're saying, how attractive is the tax structure in the UK and other regions? Maybe uh, you want to do the UK part. Uh, so, sorry, which, which uh, the tax structure? Yeah, yeah, tax structure. I think they are thinking about maybe for investment. No, look, I mean, we have one of the lowest corporation tax rates in the world. Okay, I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's probably going to have to go up a little bit, um, you know, given we're, given where we all are with COVID at the moment. But no, look, in general, I mean, the, the government will will support anybody who wants to yes. invest in this country because that's just the way we've always been. Um, we, mm -hmm. We've we've had for better or for worse, a, a long history in this stuff. And uh, we always welcome inward investment into this country in a big, big way. Always, 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 always will do. Uh, and, I, and I am responsible for that. So I have to, I'm not just telling you rubbish. Uh, it's very much, we really want, you just, I'm not sure if you saw that slide I put up. The, the investors in the offshore wind industry in the UK mm. are from China, from there, from Brazil, they're from, Abu Dhabi, they're from everywhere in the world. And this little, tiny, little country is always going to be attracting investment into good things. And I, I, I'm very proud of it. That's why I'm doing this job. So there's great opportunity and great support. So anyone interested can contact you also, right, Alice? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's going to take me a long time to answer these emails, but, but I'll try to yeah. And um, I have a question here. This is regarding um, Sharia compliant investment, maybe for Frederica and Ellen, you can add on if you have seen such a trend. As you know, Malaysians in Malaysia prioritizes Sharia compliant investments. So just on your take on you know, the opportunities for such a Islamic assets in London or in the UK as Ellen, beyond London, yeah, I must say, in the UK itself. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to start here just in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier, we are a, the, main, um, the main international market for uh, Islamic finance and the Sharia instruments. Um, so we've been seeing Sukuk bonds on our market for many years. Um, as, as, as we said just earlier, we are just now um, seeing the second Sukuk from uh, from the government, um, which uh, which was an extremely uh, important milestone. Uh, it had been in the making for quite a while, um, but but in general we have 
we've had more than uh, 100, 120 Sukuk bonds on our market mm -hmm. since we since we launched our um, our Sukuk segment. So it, it's really an area where we are strong. Of course, it's very driven also by uh, by the various diaspora um, uh, communities that that are within London uh, that have um, a keen interest in in this kind of uh, of instruments. Uh, but in general, um, there's such a diversified uh, group of investors in London um, that all these kinds of instruments are really interesting for them. Um, we haven't yet, unfortunately, seen a green for cook, but I do think it's just the next step, just given our uh, capabilities in green and our capabilities in the cook. It's just the next, uh, the next step to have uh, instruments that will intertwine the two together. Um, and uh, so something I think will, will, be, will be pushing this forward is just starting to see the investor community more and more keen to, to invest in this type of instrument. Uh, yeah. Once the issuers see the investor community looking into that kind of instrument, they will start uh, issuing them. A lot of instruments mm -hmm. are just are driven just by investor sentiment, sentiment and market sentiment. They uh, they want to issue instruments that they know the investor base will buy. Uh, so as soon as we start to get uh, an investor base really interested in this type of uh, of instrument, I, I really think it will be a, a matter of. Uh, of really <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I, can, I completely agree. I mean, as I mentioned earlier um, in one of those slides, uh, Mazdar from Abu Dhabi was one of the first investors in project finance in the UK, which is a difficult thing to assess and is a long-term risk thing. Uh, but increasingly, their parent, Mazdar's parent in Abu Dhabi, Mubadala, who of course I know well, happened right there, um, is, has just literally this week set up a fund. It's all over the Financial Times. Uh, to invest in uh, in green and life science industries in the UK. And so, yeah, look, I mean, this is, it's obvious, right? I mean, it's an obvious market for us. Um, I have an obvious opportunity for the, the investors from these countries. And uh, we've also been on, um, I'm not sure how much I can tell you, but, 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 you know, but we've also been uh, been discussing uh, green bonds from from oil rich nations in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the Middle East because they want to be seen to be doing the good thing. And so what we, and, and Federica went back to that earlier, we have to be careful about um, accusations of greenwashing because that could, could damage the market. Mm. So as long as there are very specific projects like a new green city, like the Saudis are doing, for example, then it's no big deal. But these things will have to be verified by a second, how do you put, call it, Federica? Is it a second... A second, second party opinion, opinion. Yeah. second party opinion, but they're going to say, "Well, that's that's not fair." You know, that's this not a green project, and so these things are verified very, very carefully on the London markets. And you, you're not going to get away with issuing a green bond or a social bond or whatever if you're not doing what you say with the proceeds. So I, I'm I'm perfectly satisfied. I'm sure you are, Federica, too with the standards we have in this country. They, we are leading the world on this stuff by a long way. And we're making uh, other countries realize that they have to have the same standards. Otherwise, they won't be able to benefit from what, what I said from my original point is that climate change and green finance is the opportunity of, a, of, 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 our, of our generation. Thank you, fantastic. Um, we are coming to a near end. Actually, we have reached the end of a webinar, but we will take a bit more time. I hope the audience and uh, Ellen and Federica don't mind. Two specific questions here. One is for the nature-based solutions for flood management. Ellen, this is specifically for you. Um, what is the minimum scale finance uh, for the projects? Are you seeking investments for? Some uh, Jennifer, I, I wish I had an answer for that. I'm, I'm, for, I'm trying to find out, but I don't have an answer. That's a very good question indeed. All I will tell you, is that from what I know, is that the new um, recently announced um, green uh, sovereign bond for the UK, which will be the first ever, it's going to be a big one, right? um, is, is, you know, it's billions and billions of pounds. A lot of it is going to go into government investment into uh, flood control, for example. 
And I don't know how the private sector can invest in that yet. I will find out for you as soon as I possibly know. These things move quite slowly. I mean, you, you, can, you can't <laughs> expect an answer immediately, but uh, I, I'll try my best. Yeah. Could, you, could you send me an email and I'll try to find out what the thinking okay. is about okay. that? But all you right. know is that prior, right. everyone's mentioned COP26. We're taking this very seriously across the government. And, um, uh, and one of the proceeds, we want deep green. We don't want half green. We want deep green projects to invest in. And, and, and things like that, like uh, reforesting forests or, or things like flood control uh, so we can build more houses in areas which previously were flooded is a very big priority for the government. So I don't know the answer yet. I'm being perfectly honest with you, but I'll try to find out as soon as I possibly can. Thank you for that. One last question. Uh, I'm not sure maybe both of you can answer this. Are there specific funds to invest in the UK energy efficiency yes, sector? Uh, yeah, uh, again, again, uh, sorry, Federica, I mean, you, you know more about the listed ones. You just mentioned Greencoat in yours. Greencoat's a great one. Uh, that's yeah, a listed one. There are lots of private ones and there are lots of publicly mm -hmm. listed ones on the stock exchanges. And Federica already mentioned Greencoat, which is a fab fabulous company. Um, but, um, for example, right now, Sustainable Development Capital Limited, which is one of the things that I mentioned on my presentation, is, um, is raising 650 million euros uh, for European-wide um, you know, investments into green. Uh, there's Equitix, there's Foresight, there's, you know, all, all the people I put on my early, bottom of my slide earlier. I can't recommend one over the other. That would be utterly ridiculous as a government official. But, um, but there are about 25. And if you want yeah. to find more information, I can at least put you in touch with them. I can't recommend one over the other. Otherwise, I'll get sacked. But, but in general, there are lots. Okay, There are lots of really good ones. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our webinar. Very interesting discussions with both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sure the audience found the whole webinar informative. So with that, I, I think um, we before we end, there is a slide, right? Yes. So for those of you who are interested to know more, in addition to Ellen and Federica, we do have... Uh, someone based in Malaysia itself for department, from the Department of International Trade, our colleague Nadira Ali from the Inman Investment Manager. Her email is here. If you are interested to know more about the opportunities, you may reach out to her directly or do reach out to us at the BMCC. So with that, um, thank you to all our speakers once again, and thank you to our audience. Oh, on behalf of the BMCC and the British High Commission Kuala Lumpur, thank you for joining us. Take care and stay safe. Bye. Bye, Ellen. Bye, Frederica. Bye, bye. Thank bye, you Jennifer. so much. Thank you. Thank well, you. Indeed, Jennifer. Well done. Yes, thank you.